Support for LAS comes from Casa of Los Angeles, a nonprofit organization working one on one with children in the child welfare system to ensure they have support in education, health care, and housing. Just showing up is extraordinary. More at CasaLA.org. LA is one of the world's art capitals. So, LAist and KCET's Artbound are teaming up to show you vital new documentaries about LA's exciting art scene. Get tickets now at slash events. LAist Studios. This is How to LA, where we talk about issues that energize this city. I'm Brian De Los Santos. Members of the Screen Actors Guild have now seen everything that is in the new contract proposed before the holidays, and not everyone's happy with it. The big sticking point? Artificial intelligence. Some union members don't think the AI protections worked out in the contract go far enough and are encouraging a no vote on the deal. Maybe the most high-profile person to announce their intention to vote against the ratification of the contract? Actor and sag National Board Member Matthew Modine. In a statement, Modine said he, quote, cannot endorse a contract that compromises the independence and financial futures of performers, end quote. For many in the industry, the chance that things could stall again is alarming. The writers and actors strike combined dragged on for six months, crippling a lot of people and businesses financially. A lot of folks just want to get back to work. Here are WGA members Craig Mazin and John August on a recent episode of their Script Notes podcast. Mazin is also a member of SAG. What isn't really happening in the discussion over ratification is, okay, well, what happens if you say no? Because it's a disaster if you say no. So uh, as a SAG member, I would urge people to make their voices heard and to prepare for the next negotiation. I think that that the vote will ratify. Yeah, I think it will ratify as well. And SAG negotiating committee member Jason Winston George. I'm excited for people to be able to use these protections uh, that we've been able to get for people for AI over control of your image and likeness and voice. Uh, I'm excited about the pension caps being raised for the first time in like a generation or two. The union vote on this contract is expected to wrap up tomorrow. So we thought we'd check in on where things stand. LA's reporter Robert Goroba has been reporting on the contract negotiations since the beginning. Hey, what's up, Robert? Hey, Brian. All right. First up, how about we take a look at the pros of this contract? Despite the AI concerns, there's some good things in this deal from the performance perspective. We didn't have all the details last time we talked to you about this. So tell us, what are the highlights? So I think the negotiators who worked on everything would point to uh, wage increases uh, as a big one. Um, there's a new model that increases streaming residuals for some. Um, that's another big win they're pointing to as part of this billion-dollar deal. Um, and then there's a, a long list of things that just seem to make the profession better for actors. Um, stuff like uh, terms around proper hair and makeup, uh, which was a, a big issue for some actors of color, and a sort of a laundry list of other th- smaller things. How about this AI issue? Can you tell us what the contract calls for and what some union members think is lacking? So, yeah, for one, they got required consent, informed consent, they call it, for the use of digital replicas, uh, meaning that there has to be mandatory consent from the actor for creating and using a digital replica of of them. Hmm. Um, And then it's kind of interesting to me, you know, let's say there's a, a digital replica of a performer and that's used for the same project. The producers would then have to estimate how many working days uh, that would have been in person and pay the actor their daily rate for that work. So sort of like the digital replicas getting paid (laughs) for work. Yeah. Um, And then the studios and streamers would also have to pay residuals uh, for digital replica work. Um, But, you know, all of this is really uncharted territory and the AI provisions really seem to continue to rile some some actors. So what are you hearing from folks now that this contract is laid out and people have reviewed it themselves? So since the beginning of the strike, I've been talking uh, with an actor. His name is Eric Pasoja. He does a lot of work in video games, um, you know, where, of course, digital replicas are are already there. Um, and he's, he's really been sounding the alarm since the beginning about how studios might misuse digital likenesses, um, you know, without actors' consent. 
he actually had an experience where he did work on you know one of the the big Call of Duty games in years past, and then he was surprised when his image was slapped on a completely different character. Um, you know, he says we made a mistake by not having ethical guidelines around AI in place before that technology took off, and you know he says state and federal legislators really need to get protections in place so that we can come up with some legislation that basically says this: my digital identity is mine. And that's what I'm fighting for. My face, my voice, and my movement is mine. Another one of his main concerns is enforcement. Uh, he's, you know, he's worried that the union and its members are, are not going to be able to make sure that digital likenesses aren't used without their consent. Um, and for that, he has the idea of using technologies that, that some big companies already use to what's called digitally watermark and, and fingerprint uh, performers' likenesses so that uh, their use can be tracked and identified you know, after the fact. We just need to be protected for it so that if they do use us, the operative word is cha-ching, there will be people who will be able to do two jobs at once because they'll go to one set while their digital identity works on another set. And and just to be clear, you know, he still thinks that this is a historic document is what he called the contract. And, you know, he sees this work as setting up the groundwork for many other industries. But he also says a lot of colleagues are scared right now. Um, and, you know, he thinks ultimately people could could lose work. Yeah, it's everyone you've heard from this concern across the board. Well, no. Uh, you know, I, I heard from one actor who, who emailed me pushing back, actually, on some of the coverage saying, you know, discussing AI is great, um, but fixating on it solely is is kind of dangerous. Um, he feels like the AI provisions in the agreement are, are revolutionary, was his word. Um, and he's worried the fear around AI, you know, has kind of reached this sort of conspiracy theory level of hysteria. Well, you know, like I said, though, it's it's uncharted territory. So, you know, even in our industry, it's it's things people are, are, are thinking about in the audio world as well. You know, there was a lot of excitement when the deal was first reached. I'm wondering what the union leadership has to say about this criticism over AI. They have pushed back on it. You know, I, I know um, Duncan Crabtree Ireland, who was the, the chief negotiator during all of this, uh, you know, he did an Instagram live session recently. He's been on panels talking about AI. Um, and what he said basically was that they did not have the ability to stop AI from happening because, you know, some actors in the chat would chime in and say, why can't we just ban it completely? And he said, mm-hmm. it's, it's, you know, the genie's already out of the bottle. We do not have the ability to stop AI from happening. And past history, ranging from the printing press to the Industrial Revolution to the invention of television to the invention of the Internet shows you just can't block the technology from happening. So we didn't want to waste our leverage and our bargaining power trying to do something that was impossible. And what are the studios saying? What's their take on this kind of pushback on AI? You know, we don't have a lot from them other than, you know, what they said when this tentative deal was was announced, you know, uh, earlier this month. Basically, you know, they just they said that this represents a new paradigm. Uh, it's the biggest contract on contract gains in the history of the union, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, they, they sort of tout the, the AI protections as something that's that's groundbreaking. We have to take a break, but stick around because we're going to hear more from Robert about the upcoming ratification vote for SAG-AFTRA. Support for LAIS comes from Casa of Los Angeles, a nonprofit organization that organizes community volunteers to take action and advocate for children and families in LA County's overburdened child welfare and juvenile justice systems. Casa LA works to strengthen the community by ensuring that all children and families have equitable access to resources and support to thrive. Just showing up is extraordinary. You can learn how to make a difference in a child's life who needs Casa's support at casala.org. Thanks for listening to this LAist Studios podcast. Can I tell you about our news site? It's LAist.com, and it covers news, culture, and happenings that matter to Angelinos. Like how and where to get your vaccine, how Southern Californians are fighting for racial justice, local and state politics, and how you can still take part in our vibrant food and art scene. We're working hard every day to bring you local news you care about. I hope you'll check it out. LAist is true LA stories powered by you, at LAist.com. So the vote to ratify this deal ends tomorrow. Could this deal not go through? That's always a possibility, but I haven't heard from anyone who actually thinks that that will happen. I, I think, you know, um, 
the union leadership is very much obviously uh, behind all of this and they're doing a lot to get the information in front of their their union members. So I, I don't think that uh, anyone thinks that this will fall through. I'm going to ask a basic question here. Is there like a number percentage that people have to? I had to look this up and it's not that it was it, it didn't come to mind for me either. So the contract does not become valid until a majority 50 percent plus one vote yes to approve it. Got it. So if that 50% plus one doesn't really happen, what happens afterward? So basically the negotiating committee uh, and the National Board of sag after will, will have to regroup uh, in so many words and consider their next steps. And that could include whether or not to resume the strike. Yeah, as you know, and we mentioned earlier in the podcast, these strikes have been really hard on a lot of people, not just actors, writers, crew members, but all sorts of businesses that work closely with the industry. With all this still hanging kind of in the balance, how are people feeling heading into the holidays? Well, you know, I think people are very much ready to get back to work. You know, I I haven't checked back in with some people that I talked with in the past several weeks. But, you know, before December came around, uh, they were tens of thousands of dollars in debt. They were doing things like signing up to to drive for Uber and ride shares, taking in roommates, selling off some of their possessions at um, swap meets and stuff like that. So, you know, the production hasn't picked up so fast and so much yet that all those people are all of a sudden, you know, going to be back to where they're making ends meet. So I, I imagine that they're uh, ready to get all of this behind us. All right, that was Elias Robert Gorova. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Ryan. That's Elias reporter Robert Gorova. Read the latest news on the SAG contract on LAS.com. The staff will keep you updated there. Tomorrow on How to LA, mutual aid for the unhoused in this city. We'll get requests for pepper spray, sewing kits, on top of like food and the other hygiene items we bring. Volunteers step in where government services don't. They save lives. And that's a big deal. That's really hard to say in like homeless communities. Listen to the first of our three-part series on mutual aid tomorrow. Meet you back here on our feed. This episode was produced by Monica Bushman. Our Hot to LA team also includes Erica Washington, Evan Jacoby, Maggie Botel, and Victoria Alejandro. Our intern is Tony Morales. Our executive producer is Megan Larson. And our engineer is Hazmik Pagosian. Support for this podcast is made possible by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe that quality journalism makes Los Angeles a better place to live. Imagine if you could charge your electric vehicle at the places you already love to eat, shop, and play. Whether you're at the movies, on your weekly grocery trip, or running errands at your local mall, Volta EV charging stations are built around your day-to-day and located in your community and nationwide. All you have to do is check in, plug in, and go about your day. It's EV charging made convenient. Download the Volta app to find your new favorite place to charge.